<laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of the Inspired Evolution. This week we have Gregory David Roberts. He's the author of my all-time favorite book called Shantaram. It's an incredible read if you've ever read it. If you haven't, please do yourself a solid. If you've ever read it, you know what I'm talking about, right? It is just an incredible read where fiction meets nonfiction, how much of Gregory is in the story, isn't in the story of Shantaram. It's an incredible, incredible, incredible novel. In this episode, we dive deep on the spiritual path and what it means to be walking out onto a spiritual path. There are some really key, key ingredients for Gregory that he talks about. And in there, some of them are like acknowledgement was a really key piece, how to actually walk out on a path of surrender. And this other thing that he refers to as charismatic devotion. So there are some really key pillars to um, Shantaram's <laughs> um, spirituality. And we unpack each and every one of those in this episode. It's a really yummy conversation with the man himself. Um, if you're a fan of Shantaram, you're absolutely going to love this conversation. It's all about the spirituality behind it. Um, and yeah, hopefully you enjoy this as much as I did. In there, there's going to be a moment where something clicks and you're just going to go, yep, this is ideal. When that moment happens, YouTube family, please do us a solid, give us a thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe, stay connected, stay inspired, keep evolving. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is a treat to be here today. We have with us Gregory David Roberts. How are we, sir? Blessings, blessings. Very well, thanks. Blessings from beautiful Jamaica. Oh, such a beautiful part of the world, and it is such a treat to tune in with you. For those tuning into Gregory for the first time, he's an Australian author, best known for his novel Shantaram. Um, in the story and in his own story, um, he's overcome addiction, he's escaped prison, he fled to India where he lived for a long time. And I think one of the most uh, amazing parts of Shantaram for me is where does the author end <laughs> and where does the fiction begin? And this is always a question that I had and uh, I'm not sure I'll get an answer today, but I figured I'd ask you nonetheless <laughs> to sort of see where that is uh, because it's an amazing book. It's a really incredible book. And there is so much spirituality that I picked up from Shantaram. And the, the other part to that question is you also just recently book, wrote a book called The Spiritual Path. And I know it's less fiction and more prescriptive. Why the, what was the impetus for writing The Spiritual Path? And yeah, two parts to that question. <laughs> well, uh, with The Spiritual Path, I, I started to write it after I had been um, about three years into um, serious daily devotion mm. of blowing a conch shell um, for the divine every mm. day and yeah. uh, keeping notes. It mm. was after I decided to take the leap of faith and acknowledge the divine, surrender mm. the unrequired elements within myself mm. and become devoted. And yeah. I did it sincerely, not knowing what would happen. And in the process of the first three years and keeping notes every time I blew the shell to say, to sit down afterwards when I was calm enough and keep my notes about what did I experience? What did I see? What did I feel? What happened when I was doing this in attempting to connect with the spiritual? After the first three years, I um, said to my soulmate, um, I think I should put these in the book. And she said, go ahead and do that. And I said, well, I need to do at least one more year of this. And at mm. the end of the fourth year, I said, I think I need to do at least one more year mm. of this. <laughs> was at the end of the fifth year, into the sixth year of that um, meticulous devotion, trying to be as sincere as I possibly could, that I sat down to write, um, to assemble those notes into a little book called The Spiritual Path, which just takes people on my journey of the leap of faith. Mm. What is the leap of faith for those that are tuning in? Acknowledgement, surrender, and devotion. Mm. Acknowledgement means acknowledging <clears throat> the existence of the divine, to say, I acknowledge you. <clears throat> it may sound arrogant for a human being to say, I acknowledge you, God, <laughs> um, to, to the immensity of the divine, which is beyond this universe and all the other universes. 
um, it may sound arrogant, but it's required because we have free will. I think if we were not free, we'd all be automatically connected. Um, but we have free will, and it's up to us to open that connection. So acknowledgement is the first step. I acknowledge you. The second is I surrender. And surrender doesn't mean lying on the ground and being kicked by God, as far as I can see. Mm. Surrender means surrendering the unrequired elements within your ego, mm -hmm. uh, those things that are not required to go into a sincere devotional space. Things like pride and vanity that are important in the material world. We need a measure of both or we end mm -hmm. up like hobgoblins or whatever. <laughs> we need a little pride and a little vanity. But neither of those are required when we go into a spiritual space. So surrender means looking at yourself and seeing what is absolutely essential, what is required when I go into that. And it's basically humility, honesty, sincerity, authenticity. Mm. And um, so practicing that and getting rid of those unrequired elements, it doesn't mean ridding yourself permanently. It means finding a way to shift things like, say, ego and pride and vanity, to shift them to the margins when you go into that devotional space. They're going to come back later on, but hmm. in that space to learn to shift them to the margin, that's surrender. And then devotion, which is finding a way to actually give something in a physical way, if you can, through dance, hmm. through music, through blowing a conch shell, through whatever it is that allows you to give something to the divine rather than constantly asking for hmm. something from the divine. I love that. I love that. So, Let's talk about each of those three pillars because the book you wrote is an ode to, well, it's the book you wish you would have read um, when you were a, a younger, younger version of yourself. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I think when I didn't realize that when I started writing it, because I just thought I'd keep some kind of record of what I was doing. I thought somebody might be interested, but once I got into it, I realized I was writing it for that younger self. Mm. that was always searching, no matter where I was, for a spiritual teacher, for some kind of enlightenment, some gem of wisdom that I could store away. It might be grandmother's wisdoms, which I collected all over the world. Everywhere I went, a standard question was, can you give me one, one wisdom from your grandmother? Mm. And um, so that was a nice way of actually getting connected with people, but also it was, a, it was something I did and collecting that kind of wisdom, spiritual wisdom, meeting teachers and so on. After years and years of that, of it's a culmination, really, um, of all of those things. Calling that, uh, it's a journey, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. And so, one of the key elements you said is acknowledge, and let's begin with acknowledgement. Why do you think there is such a resistance in um, today's day and age for people with acknowledging the divine? Like, do you find that there is a resistance? Obviously, you've written that as a key element to the book. Um, and potentially seeking within yourself, like what are some of the resistances to acknowledgement of the divine? I think there is a hard scientific view, which a lot of my close friends have, um, mm. and I admire them tremendously, that anything that cannot be quantified, weighed, and so on, um, belongs in the basket of superstition rather than the basket of a spiritual science of a different mm. way of understanding things. Um, you know, the same people, the same scientific friends of mine, accept the fundamentals of particle physics and uh, the metaphysical nature of life, that it's mm. there, but it doesn't weigh anything. It has no volume. It's traveling at the speed of light and nothing else can. And mm. if you connect two photons and separate them and charge them the same way and separate them by the width of the universe and change the polarity of one, the other one will Go change instantaneously. <laughs> Yeah. These are impossibilities that confounded mm. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, and many other scientists, mm. because I think they, they thought of them as superstitious rather than uh, metaphysical aspects. They are, mm. there, are, there is a, a physical aspect to light, uh, to a photon of light. It bounces off a mirror. We can focus it to make things hotter. But at the same time, there's a metaphysical aspect because it's there, but it's not there in the normal sense of things. Mm. and so on and it has these other properties so i think there's a hard science that's very resistant and i respect mm. that they just have an extremely high bar for what they will accept is reasonable uh, and then there is um a kind of if you like ideological or political resistance which equates uh, the spiritual with religion and tends to equate religion with um a, a oppression in the past or with an extreme conservative view that's holding back the march toward progress as they may mm. see it so there's that as well in resistance. 
But I don't think those are huge. I think the biggest movement in the world is certainly one that received a gigantic catalytic reaction uh, in COVID is a movement toward a deeper spiritual understanding of our planet and of ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is happening everywhere, especially mm -hmm. among young people who are reaching out to this all over the place. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for me, it, uh, it I guess from your writings and being a, a fan for quite some time, even reading um, both Shantaram and both The Mountain Shadow, both of them are interlaced and woven with so much spiritual wisdom in there as it is. Um, I do wonder um, from that point, what was the, what was the impetus for yourself to need it, like to confirming and creating this path of um, devotion the way that you did? Like, was there like, a, what was the impetus to really wanting to create a devotion for yourself? That was my spiritual teacher, I would say. Um, I, I, my soulmate says, you've always been a spiritual person all your life. Mm. Uh, I would, had rejected that for years and years, said, no, 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 I'm not a spiritual person. I, I just didn't understand everybody's spiritual. Um, some mm. people find it easier to express their spiritual nature. Some people find it harder, but everybody's spiritual. It took me a while to realize this. But um, I, I think because I had accumulated a lot of understandings and a lot of teachings from different teachers, but had never found a teacher I liked mm. to follow enough to say, this is my teacher. I want to follow this person. I want to I want to connect myself to this person who I think is profoundly connected to the spiritual. Mm. And that didn't happen for decades and decades until mm. I finally met my teacher about eight years ago now. Um, and it, as it happens, we had spent decades um, only, you know, a postcode away from each other in Mumbai and had never met. <laughs> and he, he was the catalyst because uh, what I saw in him was charismatic devotion the kind of devotion I had not seen among priests before. Mm -hmm. I, the nearest thing to it was, if you like, the immersion that's in Sufi ritual. Um, mm -hmm. that, that I'd seen where people were trancing into a different, going into a different way of consciousness, different state of consciousness, through music, dance, and so forth, and singing and chanting. But this partic particular practitioner performed his rituals with such a, a rigorous intensity, authenticity, sincerity, mm. that it was simply stunning the first time I saw it. And uh, I watched for three years, watched him perform, um, observed, learned, sat there and asking questions before and after his ceremonies and so on. He always answered them. I filled notebooks with um, the answers to the questions I'd had for many years that he answered every one. Mm. And then when I went back to Australia to, for a while to look after my parents who were both terminally ill, Sorry. Uh, he, he gave me a conch shell and he said, take this with you. Mm. When you go back, I may not see you for a while. And I said, what should I do with it? And he said, oh, I'll put it on a windowsill if you like, or, or blow it in devotion as you've seen me blow it. If you want to, it's up to you. Mm. So I readied myself in the first year of trying to get ready to do it and then blew the conch for the first time. I can mm. show it to you. <laughs> yeah. So this is a conch shell. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love the geometry of it. So amazing. Isn't isn't it? Gorgeous. Can't beat nature. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Yeah. What design about here? <laughs> so a little blow of the conch. I'll do a down blow just for the sake. Just. Just a little blow of the conch. But to do this for a very long blow, taking a very long breath, getting yourself to 22 seconds, 24 seconds, 26 seconds, 32 seconds, mm. stretching out that breath and blowing, 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 blowing until you've got literally nothing left. Mm. And doing this um, over and over again, watching him do that um, was the, the catalyst for me. And mm. once that came into my hand, this happened to belong to his mother oh. who blew the shell every day until she died and then he passed oh. it to me so i'm actually keeping her devotion alive oh. you know, like, in order to keep her alive if i'm her devotion alive, if i'm lucky if we're very fortunate someone will keep this my devotion alive and keep that chain of devotion when i'm gone 
That's beautiful. <laughs> That's super beautiful. I love the continuity of that. And yeah, it's a, it's an intriguing piece to feel into how important a, um, I don't want to use the word lineage, but like a, a teacher can be. Um, and I know that for my own self, like on the path of the inspired evolution, like I'm following my inspirations and trying to step into a role behind them. Um, and potentially, you know, some part of me, it's interesting because some part of me really awoken when I actually thought that there was not going to be someone coming for me. I think I spent a lot of my life as an adolescent male hoping that, and what I call, uh, I was I was struggling with hoping for a saviour. And I really thought there was going to be someone that was going to come and make sense of like why life was this way. <laughs> and hopefully there was a clearer path for me to move ahead. And a big part of me cracked open when I realized that actually that well, I had the I had the realization that potentially that's not going to happen, and that I'm going to have to show up for myself in many ways. Um, and what I'm hearing in this story is, and knowing your story, that yes, you've shown up for yourself, but then also there is that quanta which actually can be crossed through particular guidance and having a a teacher and a mentor. Is that is that what I'm hearing here? Yes, very much so. Uh, uh, I think in your case, mm -hmm. um, that um, person did ride to the rescue. You just didn't realise at the time that it would be you mm. riding to your own rescue, which yeah. you did. Yeah. So someone did, and it's, you just didn't know that it was going to be you who would do that, and, and you certainly did. And, of course, that is what we've raised. We, in the past, raised an entire generation and generations of girls with the concept that a prince would come and save them from the tower, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And yeah. you can't sell that to girls today. They're all, they own the tower. And yeah. they're <laughs> they don't even make the prince, if you don't have it. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, I think um, it is that. The thing about the teacher is they say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And of course, mm -hmm. that's true. I, I honestly think at any other time in my life, I would not have been ready to meet him in the same way that I was when I did meet him. Mm -hmm. the, there's also that the, when the teacher is ready, the student appears because mm -hmm. you, you end up in a transformative relationship. If it gets, if it's profound and if it's honest and it has to be, and both sides are being scrupulously honest with each other and critical if required with each other mm -hmm. to just see where that goes and not be, a, because the essence of this is that faith is freedom from fear. Mm -hmm. So you should never be afraid to say something to your guru, even though you may respect him or her tremendously above many, many, many others in your life. Mm -hmm. You should never be afraid of this. And that, that the guru or the teacher is trying to build that resilience and strength within you, spiritual resilience and spiritual strength. And it becomes a two-way street because you are informing the teacher. The teacher over time calls you up and says, listen, I've got this problem, talk to me about this, mm. and so on. What is your opinion of this? And that's impossible when you first meet the teacher, mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. But over years and years of developing a relationship, it can be that the, when the teacher is ready, the student appears in the same way. But it becomes a, a beautiful relationship, a mystical relationship, and it's one based on trust, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. And as I'm hearing you speak, I can, I can hear the mysticism behind it. It's almost like yeah two energies waiting to find each other and when they do it's the like portals open up like it sounds amazing um i love the piece that you shared about surrender and the way you articulated it as well so we talked about acknowledgement we talked about um charismatic devotion i love that i really love that um and the piece around um surrender and releasing um did you call it the unrequired parts of ourself? Yes, um, I think unrequired isn't really a word. Oh, God, but I, I love just, it. You... <laughs> it, it, it's, it just, it's so useful to just hear it put that way. Um, they're not bad, yeah. they're not evil, they're just not required in a devotional space. Same as malice and so on. Malice is not required, um, you know, for instance, that's also not required yeah. in that space. Ill will toward others, resentment, if you've got a grumbling resentment, you can't bring that into that devotional space. It will impair the purity of what you're trying to do. So you have to get that stuff ready before you go in. You know, can I just say something? You yeah. were talking before about those catalytic things and, and it, within that to have a capacity to see yourself and see where you're going and so on. Mm. And that happened to me, I have to say, when I was put into solitary confinement. Mm. It, it is without a doubt the first 
very significant and important catalyst that happened to me in my life. The second, apart from people you know that you love who build that within you. Of course. My teacher is the second one. Meeting that the teacher gave me a, a focus to think I can be and am a spiritual person, actually, which mm -hmm. I sort of denied my whole life. But the first one was being in solitary. The first year was a, um, a difficult year and a lot of not really coming to terms with it and a bit of, you know, the sense of denial mm -hmm. and so on. This is not happening and it's not my fault. Why is this? When the calendar turned over into the second year, I'd mm -hmm. already done one and I knew I had one more to do. So I yeah. knew now what a year is and uh -huh. I knew I had that in front of me and I heard the the people celebrating the horns of the cars and fireworks going off you could hear them even underground and, and solitary but um, it to me was a clarion call to change to stop to look at everything that I'd done in my past to make that realization that every pain and humiliation had been a beast of my own creation that it was me Mm. And if I wanted to change, I had to acknowledge the past. I had to feel, I had to get it. I had to accept responsibility and then say, if I have responsibility for the, for the past, I can now take responsibility for the future. But when I, I, I had to first do that, and that ha I don't think I even would have come to grips for another, who knows, five, 10 years, had I not been slammed into solitary. And it was one of the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. And I profited tremendously from it. It's extremely hard to do. Anyone will tell you it's not easy to do two years in solitude. However, it Doesn't was sound it. In my life, an absolute gift. Yeah. And so how what I'm hearing in there is the um whew, well, I can't if I try to wrap my head around two years in solitary confinement and I don't think my head can actually crunch those crunch that um that experience. Um in there, like the the key thing that I'm hearing though is the um is the availability to responsibility um, and that being the real gem and the real piece that came through there in terms of even you said like a lot of the stuff that um, potentially even got you into certain situations was the beast of your own, of your own marking. Um, yeah. Was that like, it sounds when you put it that way in a sentence, it's like, Oh yeah, it's digestible. Um, but when I actually think about what you're saying, it was a process of like two years being by yourself. Yes, and the first year is was that sort of grumbling, whinging year where you're still mm -hmm. the old person you were. And the yeah. second year begins and you either keep grumbling or you change and you start to think about it more seriously. And there's no other opportunity. If you just suddenly said to your friends, I'm going to spend two years in a box, mm -hmm. they'd think you were mad. So yeah. you can't volunteer to do yeah, this. This is a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has to be imposed on you and, and so on. You can either see it as a terrible punishment or an opportunity. And it was an opportunity. Um, and, it, and I changed my life there, down there. I, on the first day of, the, of New Year's Day in the second year, the guard opened the door and I said, you look so well today. How are you? Which he did. He was mm. actually beaming. He must have had a holiday or something before that. <laughs> And I said, you look so well today. How are you? And he almost had a heart attack. He was so surprised that, I, mm. that the prisoner said this thing with a smile. And it was the beginning of my change in my reaction and my relationship with everyone in the prison, with it, no matter what uniform they were wearing. Wow, that is profound. Gregory, do you often, and I, this is a, this is a timeless question, I guess, um, but do you often think about, and what are your thoughts on, um, this human experience, like it, what I'm hearing is like that confinement was so integral to your transformation. Was that something that was always meant to be part of your journey? Do you feel that way about it? And do you think even some of the things leading into that transformative experience were necessary to land you in that experience? Or is that not really the case? I think that um, almost every positive thing that happened in my life was uh, something that was meant to happen on my journey, so to speak. Mm. They were think people I was supposed to meet, things I was supposed to do, experiences I was supposed to have that were that you look back and they all contribute toward a spiritual development of who you are. And then there are the other things which mm. were the result of my act of will. Mm. And, you know, that that's me. I did that. And uh, um, every negative thing, basically, I could take it back to a weakness in my own character that let mm -hmm. me do that each time or led me down that path until I put a stop to it and said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm changing my life. Yeah. 
Yep. And uh, so those weaknesses in character are some of those pieces that obviously we all have those. Um, and so the, some of those pieces are the pieces that you were, like you said before, are the pieces that you opened your up, yourself up to surrendering. Um, tell us a little bit about, like, I heard you share the piece on surrender um, and certain elements that we'd like to surrender, like anger and that sort of stuff and, you know, ill willing and that sort of stuff. But actually the active process of it like how what is the process for surrendering some of the unrequired parts of yourself ourselves that you've that you've um that you've yeah gone down the path of actually exercising I, i'm certainly not in any position to um advise or teach anyone else mm. i can only tell you what um because i'm not qualified uh yeah i can only tell you what i did we'd love to um, glean your wisdom <laughs> <laughs> excuse me well I think um, if I, now that I go back and look at it and I've had opportunity to do that, mm. I think the first thing is acknowledgement of your own wrongdoing and response, accepting responsibility for it. Uh, um, because there are two things that are going to be, that you're gonna to have to deal with when you wanna enter a spiritual space without all that baggage. Mm -hmm. One is the stuff you've done coming from who you are and then figure out why. What was that weakness in my character that made me do this again and again or get me into those spots again and again? What, mm. what was it? And if what was the recklessness in me that would make me stand on the front wall of a maximum security prison at one o'clock in the afternoon? Where did that come from and why? And so on. So dealing with that aspect of it within yourself, the harm you've done and the, let's say, unproductive elements in your own character, dealing with those things first. Once you've got that pretty clear and you think, okay, this is who I am. I accept responsibility for what I've done. And I'm remorseful, meaning I'm not going to do anything like that ever again. I've, there's a line in the sand, not happening. I've changed. I've moved on. I regret. I feel remorseful. I'm sorry for it. And I'm moving on. That's required. Then when you feel tidied up, you're going to get to the interaction between you and other people. Mm. And there may well be, in, not particularly in my case, but there may well be in the case of some, particularly some people I know, their next level, they may get there with themselves in meditation, yoga, and all these things they do to get themselves in a good space within themselves, but they still have angry resentments about other people. Mm. And so that's the second level, which is mm. dealing with other people. And you've got to tidy that up. Where, where do you feel guilty about something you may have done? and you've got to resolve it where do you this is where it is with other people why do you feel resentment resentment is as a person i think really accurately once said resentment is an unmet need or desire mm. so a resentment is a need or desire that's not being met in your mm. life and that's going to boil over as a resentment and you need to find it what's the unmet need or desire that's making me yeah Rumbling. wow that's really that's actually really clear that's actually a really really <laughs> useful tool so dealing with that's the second part so within yourself get tidy then get tidy with other people mm. and then get the third thing is duties and responsibilities you can't just plunge yourself into the spiritual if you're abandoning all your duties and responsibilities you may have to your family to other people to people who maybe depend on you mm -hmm. so the first one tidy yourself up tidy up your relationships with others, even historical ones going past, bury the hand. It will all, all grumbles. Get that out of your system and then get yourself into those aspects of your life that, are, that you can <laughs> develop from that point. So there are sort of steps involved in mm -hmm. doing that and it's a process, as anyone will tell you. And yeah. it's ongoing. It's not as though finish stage one, I'm cool. Now stage two is <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's an ongoing process. And if you if you stop, it means you don't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. And yeah, thanks for reminding us that it is a process. The um the third piece that you mentioned is, you know, there's ourselves, there's our family and friends and our relationships. And the old like the last piece, the third step is also you know, your duty, your sense of duty and the way we live our life. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that in terms of a spiritual path? Like how important is that piece? Because we would often find that, you know, there are many different paths for spirituality. There are those that I'm sure, you know, are sitting in the mountains in the Himalayas that are, you know, holding 
a frequency for themselves. There are those that are on a surfboard every day and that's them and their spiritual path, you know. Um, but then the sense of duty and the sense of commitment to your life as your own spiritual path. Um, speaking from someone that, you know, reading into, yeah, again, reading into your books and, you know, the the tenacity that the characters always have or the, or the protagonist always had for showing up for life and being on his path, um, I guess, gleaning some of the wisdom of that spirituality. Um, how important is it to commit to our path and show up for our path in life? Well, it's critically important. Um, in the you know, material world, you have a, a path, and we might call it your you know, karmic path in this world, a set of responsibilities, duties that you accumulate, that um, just you know, the debt you owe to your parents to begin mm. with, if you have one, have them, and so on. Uh, that physical world also has a parallel in the spiritual where you're starting to accumulate your lessons and starting to develop as a spiritual person mm. in those two parallels. The, duties that we perform in this life um they're important because the vast majority of us are not going to be uh, people who can just cut off completely the way let's say the gautama buddha did hmm. it was a married man with children and just said that's it see ya and went on a spiritual path he was a prince it might have helped at the time but <laughs> Um, it's that's not something that is even advisable, uh, if you know what I mean. That that's why there are not that many Buddhas in this world, so to speak. So for most of us, for me and for most people, it's not that we still are in this material world. So the way that our spiritual sense and our material sense blend together, that we accept that this is a material world thing, this is a spiritual world thing, but I can bring a spiritual perspective to my work in the material world. I can mm. do that too, even though I understand they're two different things and so on. Commerce, contracts, things like this, they're all, too, as an artist, you sign them, you have them drawn up, you become a, a partner in, in business or whatever. This is all to do with the material world, mm. but you can bring a spiritual perspective to what you're doing if you want to or not, as mm. you choose. And so I think the two, if you want, the two can be blended together. You can have a spiritual perspective, for instance, if I just can continue to make it a little clearer. There are, I think, among many, many others, two really important spiritual questions. Am I worthy? Mm. How much giving is in my intention? Now, these are spiritual. When you go into that spiritual space and you're trying to connect with the divine, you ask yourself, am I worthy? Did, am I clean enough? Second, am I right? You know what it means. And the mm. second, you know, how much giving is in my intention? How much is about what I can give? And um, it's like saying, you're the divine, you're, you're beyond wanting and giving, you invented those things, you're beyond mm -hmm. that. But I'm free, you, you made a world in which I'm free, and I can freely give this to you. So I freely give it. And if you enjoy it, great. If you don't, I'll do better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That is how much giving is in my intention. Mm -hmm. Asking and taking is not a bad thing. Please, God, help me. Give me this and give me that. Not a bad thing, especially mm. if it's sincere. And it often works. But going into that space, if you want connection, going into the frequency of this universe, which is, I think, an expression of divine giving. If you give, you're going into the frequency that created this in the first place, divine giving. You become a part of that frequency of giving and you get a deeper connection, I feel. Or at least a let's say a more charismatic one for you personally than when you're on your knees begging for help, which is not a bad thing, but not necessarily the most acute way to form your connection. Mm. So asking the two spiritual questions, am I worthy? How much giving in my, is in my intention, which are profoundly important for the spiritual space, they can be applied in the material world to take a spiritual perspective and say, this thing that I'm doing, I want to go into business with a person, I'm signing a contract or whatever. Am I worthy of this mm -hmm. with these other people? Am I in it for the long haul? Have I got the right kind of intention? And how much is about what I'm giving? How much is about what I can get? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Is there a balance between what I'm giving and what I'm getting? Or is it all about get and not give? Yeah. Those two spiritual questions can still be used in the material world. And I think that's how we blend these things together, taking a, sp a perspective from one into the other. And bridging that, wow, that's profound. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. In there, like the question that sort of begs itself of me is, 
do you feel like the spiritual path, like I'm reading like into the subtext of also the timing of when you've pretty brought this book to the world. Um, obviously it's aligned deeply to what's happening in your personal world. Um, and so the timing is just right for it to come into the world. But do you think this book, uh, the importance of this book now, um, is that something that you feel? Um, and if so, why? No, uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I, the last thing I think is that it's important. I don't know um, how people will react to it, but I do know that if I got this book um, at any other time in my life, if someone put it in my hands, it would have helped me a lot in helping me to form my own perspective. Mm. Not that somebody would take my perspective and say, here's the answers and I, gee, I've got my little blueprint now. Mm. It's a personal thing for me. But I hope that it would help as, um, someone out there to start forming their own perspective about what the spiritual means. To a large extent, I've experienced from entering a devotional space and taking the leap of faith, mm -hmm. I've experienced all sorts of judgmentalism from some of my scientific friends, mm. not all of them, but from a few, and a, um, a kind of hostile skepticism um, almost aggressive, and, uh, you know, you, you can't do this, and mm. why are you doing this, and, and so on. Um, that, that's a part of, of doing this, of taking this step on, the, on this spiritual path. What I'm hoping for in this book is that my scientific friends can see that you can have a, a scientific perspective on the spiritual mm. and a spiritual perspective on the scientific Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that my scientific friends, if they, if, at least, if, of course, I don't expect them to agree, mm -hmm. but that at least to say, oh, I get it now. This is what you mean when you talk about the spiritual. You're mm -hmm. not talking about Ouija boards, you know, and so on. It's not superstition and that it's something much more profound and it emerges from nature. Mm -hmm. It is not something we impose on nature. It emerges from this natural world. Yeah, I love that. And how much of, um, I guess, those, like those opinions are partially also your own before you went on this path, which alludes to this terminology, the leap of faith? <laughs> hmm. Well, certain perspectives and certain things having, you know, a long experience of, it's funny, I kept saying I'm not a spiritual person, but I've prayed with believers in a hmm. dozen countries yeah. In, mosques, in synagogues, in temples, in churches, and in gurdwaras. Um, mm. I've rung bells, I've, I've sung, I've chanted, and I've prayed, and I've learned the prayers um, so that I could participate and try to experience what people experience when they immerse themselves together in an mm. expression of their faith. And I, I did this across the world. And I think each one of those things, so you were saying before about a writer, where does the writer begin? Where does the life begin? Where does the mm. writer end? Where does the life begin? These sort of things. It's a bit like this as well, the accumulation of these spiritual experiences and immersion in, in people's expressions of faith and so on. Become, a, um, a, a, if you like, a river. That, that's the river that carries you. It's basically the river of other people's, for someone like me who's, mm. who was a very skeptical, you know, hardcore scientific philosopher, philosophical inquirer and so mm. on and, and and not finding any religion that i was ready to accept but and so on the thing that drove me forward again and again and again was the quality of the faith of the people who believed mm. of the believers no matter what religion when they were really sincere the quality of their faith was palpable you could feel it the hair stand up on your skin what those people are experiencing together is a, a, a communal sense of their authentic sincere love of something beyond justice something that's beyond this and it's an, it's a, an inspiring thing and i think that's the river that i kept riding on the river of faith that i found everywhere until i mm. myself was ready to take that leap of faith i love that thank you so much for sharing that i love that a ode to faith and in there i guess the question that i love to ask is what does um an inspired evolution look like for you for a collective um in terms of like you know you've put out some really amazing books in the world, um, especially this new one, helping people crack open to their spirituality and their spiritual path and just inviting them into that. Um, what is the inspired evolution of that? What are you hoping that the future potentially um, holds? Yeah, for, for like, is the intention that more and more people are coming on to an awareness of their spirituality and walking the path with a bit more spiritual awareness? Or I shouldn't put words in your mouth, please. <laughs> what is your inspired evolution? I think. Um... 
you know, there's an old, there's a way of looking at it that um, a city is as clean as the river that runs through it. Mm. Um, you know, if the river is dirty and polluted, there's a problem. If the river is fresh and clean and you can drink from it, that's a pretty good community. So they're doing something very right. It's the same kind of thing that we're facing at the moment. Um, the world that we live in is, um, I think, moving toward a broader understanding of what the spiritual is at the same time as it's moving toward a much more profound affection for and protection of the planet. Mm. There's kids today who literally put their lives, their careers, their everything on the line for this because it is the most important issue that, in their lives more than anything else. And that's a generation and it's building and building. I think there's a parallel that as we start to, you know, clean that river running through the city, as mm. we start to clean the planet, it will reflect who we are inside. Uh, at the moment, we have lived for 25,000, 30,000 years of our modern domesticated life with a principle that the end justifies the means. Mm. It's always be, I need this house, so I'm going to cut down those trees because the end justifies the means. Okay. However, in this world and in this age, we now realize that the means must justify the end. The mm -hmm. way that we do things must justify the thing that we want to do in the end. That has become that important. So instead of having that old way of thinking, an entitled way to think, the end justifies the means for us because we own it all and so on. Now we realize we are children of the planet. The planet is not a, our toy in our pocket. We are children of the planet that will be here long after we've gone long after humans have gone from the planet, the planet will still be here. Mm. Plenty planet. There'll still be plenty. How long? Mm. A million years? Five million? Ten million? <laughs> How long do people think we're going to last? This planet will be here for four billion years. So the yeah. planet's here long after us, long after we're gone. When we get that in our heads and realize what the perspective is, that this is our mother and we have to love her and protect her and nurture her, when the planet starts to green again and mm. starts to work properly, we too will be spiritually transforming because each one is a mirror of the other and neither can exist without each other. Mm. Thank you so much for articulating that that way, Gregory. Really, really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. I, um, yeah, on behalf of myself and the Inspired Evolution Tribe, I want to thank you for sharing yourself so openly, so abundantly here with us today. And uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, your writings have been nothing short of transformative um, for myself. And so for those that are tuning in, we'll put a link to The Spiritual Path and also Shantaram. You can get them pretty much everywhere <laughs> that you can get books. So um, I'll put a link to all of that in the show notes here as well. And uh, I know that it's not just today's conversation, Gregory, that informs, you know, the wisdom here. It's a lifetime's work. So just acknowledging you um, for all that work that informs today's conversation, the work you put into it. And on behalf of myself, the Inspired Evolution Tribe, um, yeah, we're all wishing you the best going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless and keep you safe and big love from Jamaica. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah! Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve. Yeah,